If you're <laughs> watching this right now and you haven't hit the like button, Billy, get on it. Bug your brother. Tell him to do the same. So I did the Spencer Horwitz interview by myself yesterday, buddy. And I got to give you a little bit of credit here because just going solo on an interview, it's funny because it's how we well, I've never done roll. that. We I've never, yeah, I've never like, gone solo on an interview. I can't imagine that. Gone, you've never gone solo on an interview and it, it is a little weird, but it is how we kind of used to do it where you would like, you would be in the background all the time, but you were still there to count in. And I, it's so weird that counting in is what threw me off. Cause I was like, I'm like, all right, Spence, I'm going to count us in and then we'll get going. And I was like, three, two, one. Weird that I'm the one doing the three, <laughs> two, one here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that was, uh, that was a really fun little interview, by the way. Uh, Spencer has been so generous with his time with us in the past as well. And come on. And if you haven't heard his interview from last year, you should check it out because it is an excellent interview. But we are going to be releasing this Horowitz interview ASAP. Uh, we've got Davis Schneider on the books already. So we'll be releasing that. Um, am I putting you on the spot here to to give a date? Should we just hold off on that? Or is tomorrow a possibility? Well, let's... I let's want to hold... Okay. Yeah, let's hold off. Uh, we also have Chad Dallas. Yes, we do. So we are, once again, finding ourselves with a backlog of, of great interviews. Let's, let's all hold up off on for Patreon. Now. They are all up on Patreon right now. So uh, if you can't wait, go check them out. I, I do want to acknowledge we, and I think I texted you this. We were watching the Jays game. I think it was Sunday or Sunday afternoon. And to hear Dan and, and Buck mention all three yeah. of these guys as, yeah. you know, potential candidates of, uh, you know, next man up kind of potential and the great seasons mm -hmm. that they're having down in AAA. And it was like, Hey, yeah. We just interviewed that guy again. Hey, we just interviewed that guy too. And then it was like the yeah. full trifecta of uh, David Schneider, Spencer Horowitz, and Chad Dallas. So kudos Chad to you, Scott. You, you got your, your finger on the pulse. You know yes, where to I, look I, on that, that radar. So I definitely try to have my finger on the pulse. But one thing about Chad Dallas that surprised me a little bit is that he's 22. And it's just like you forget how young these kids are. And especially yeah. when they start to really excel, like Chad Dallas is having himself an insanely good season, uh, complete domination in Vancouver at high A, And he got bumped up to double A and he had his first setback of the year right before we talked to him, where I think he allowed four earned runs and in five innings or something like that. But it was, it was easily the worst outing of his year. And to just know his youth and the fact that he's still, working on gaining velo like that's the thing with these 21 22 year olds is literally these kids bodies are still developing and growing as well you know like yeah. muscle mass is being added and chad dallas is topping out even when i was like so you're hitting 94 95 and he was just like well like 93 <laughs> like, i was like man i know you were hitting 93 i'm trying to like give you a little <laughs> extra here you just buy in <laughs> uh, awesome but even though there is a lot of talk about how the Blue Jays maybe are lacking when it comes to the farm system, there is a lot of talent down there, and there is reasons to be excited. The The thing that's taking the wind out of some of these um, prospect evaluator sales is that there isn't the super high-end guy knocking on the door in AAA, which – has been a problem for a couple of years now. And and the pitching development has been a problem, but we are seeing that development kind of come within. But this has been the problem, right? Is that there's nothing at that upper level, but there are lots of reasons to be excited in high A, even double A. You know, there's guys that are really impressing. So... And that's the thing with those guys in uh, uh, low, high A and and double A is a slight jump forward. They reevaluate the prospect rankings and all of a sudden the whole system changes, right? You just need a couple of guys to take big steps forward. Anyways, uh, we will have uh, a schedule for these interviews to be released, hopefully ASAP. Hopefully we can get one out this week. If not, we should be able to get them all out shortly. Um, 
I promise we're not holding on to them, crossing our fingers. One of them gets called up, although David Schneider and Spencer Horowitz are literally on the verge of getting called up. Um, Brandon Belt pulling his hamstring there. It, it looks like he's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. I know I was watching Twitter to see if there were any moves and there weren't so far. And uh, they showed a video of all the boys coming in dressed like Matt Chapman. I don't know if you saw that, Adam, but it was pretty no. funny. They had a they had a dress like Chappie morning and they had a, a, all the guys coming in and they're all in their like unbuttoned shirts and like they're <laughs> nice. <laughs> they're collared patterned shirts. It was pretty funny. But anyways, uh-huh. uh, these two guys are just one injury away from being the next guy up, both Schneider and and Horwitz. Uh, just you mentioned not having a lot of like exciting prospects uh, that are on the verge, and we'll touch on this uh, later in the episode as we get to uh, trade speculation and talk. Um, all the Blue Jays like Ricky Tiedemann. Double A this year, he's still, I mean, there was talk maybe he could make an appearance, make his MLB debut at some point this year if all things went well. But The injury did have his, has definitely slowed that development down. Right. And then like our number two prospect here, I'm just going on the MLB.com mm-hmm. uh, prospects list, but Brandon Barriera, I mean, he was our, I think, first uh, draft pick last year. He's in yeah. single A. Uh, Arelvis Martinez, been a lot of hype on him for a few years. He's only in double A. Uh, Tucker Tolman, single A. Sam Burst, double A. Cade Doughty, high A. Um, so as you can see, all of these top prospects within the Blue Jays system, they're not at triple A. The only guys we have at triple A that are in our top 10 for prospects is Yasfer Zulueta and Addison Barger. Um, by comparison... The pesky Baltimore Orioles, who it feels like just called up, I don't know, three superstars from AAA (laughs) in the last 12 months. Uh, I mean, their number one prospect, Jackson Holiday, drafted last year, 19 years old. He's at high A right right now. Other than that, Colton Kowser, AAA. Jordan Westberg, AAA. Heston Mm -hmm. Kierstad, AAA. D.L. Hall, Triple A. Joey Ortiz, Triple A. Is Connor knocking Norby, on the door. Like they right. are on the verge of, like, yeah, it is. So the Orioles are not going away. It is frustrating. They, I don't know what the right answer is, but like that is a team that is, the cupboards are Adam, stocked. They have, they have to go after pitching at the trade deadline, right? Like the Orioles got to be in on this season. They can't yeah. lose this year, right? Well, I'm I'm looking. I mean, with the prospects that they have right now, they really could at be a triple team to A. Go out and, they could yeah. really be a big spender. Um, I mean, I know everyone. No one in their about, starting rotation really excites me. Kyle you know Gibson, Dean thinking? Kramer, Kyle Bradish, Tyler Wells, Austin Voth. That's their depth chart for starting pitchers. They're all like high three, low four ERA. They don't. And we've talked about this, right? That like their starting ca- their starting pitching is definitely the Achilles heel of the yeah. Orioles. You know what I was thinking though, buddy? Everyone uh, keeps saying, "Oh, imagine if the Blue Jays bring Marcus Stroman back." But what really scares me is the Orioles going out and getting Marcus Stroman, a proven guy in the AL East who loves to compete, fiery, and a dude who has been there, done that in the playoffs. I, I don't know, man. That just seems to make a lot of sense. They need that top end of the rotation guy, and they also have the capital to give up. That's what the Cubs are going to be after, especially considering Stroman's still under a couple years of control. So something yeah. to watch there. All right, let's okay. get to proper. Mailbag. We haven't even we haven't even let everyone know. Yes, hello and welcome everybody to the mailbag. Uh, this is the walk off. I'm Scott Belford, joined as always by the best co-host in the biz, Adam Mack. By the way, and this actually kind of made me feel good, Adam, even though I will give an apology along with it. We did get, uh, I bet you over, it had to have been pushing 20 messages on Twitter from people being like, where the heck have you guys been this week? I know we had to cancel long toss last minute uh, a week ago Sunday. Mailbag we wound up needing to cancel last minute. The Friday show, despite us, uh, despite literally both Adam and I trying to 
connect numerous times. It just didn't wind up happening. So uh, sincere apologies to everyone. We know that a lot of this is that we are normally so consistent, or at least that's what I tell myself, right? And uh, to just go off the di disappear off the map for a week. Uh, not cool. So apologies. Adam's in the middle of buying a house and I was emceeing my first cousin and best buddy's wedding. So we just had a, a big week, but we're back at it. Back at and it. Appreciate all the messages. And there were even some who were concerned about us. Some who were like, what the fuck are your guys' problem? <laughs> so, you know, it was the typical range of messages. <laughs> Uh, before we do get into mailbag, I do wish to just remind everybody we are doing our first live podcast here in Calgary, Bottle Screw Bills, one week from Thursday, so June 22nd, and we are giving our code out, walk off, okay, so the code is walk off for five bucks off the ticket. The ticket's going to wind up with that five bucks off costing you $20. There's going to be comedy. There's going to be giveaways. We're going to talk Blue Jays. We're going to be interactive and doing a mini mailbag going into the crowd. It is going to be a very fun baseball centric podcast live. And it's going to be on a day where the Blue Jays aren't playing. So if you are a Calgary Blue Jays fan, Adam and I are really trying to get all of us under one roof if we can. We know that there's a huge faction of Jays fans in Alberta, and we're trying to um, let us all all meet each other. You know, even within the walk-off community, I know uh, Bringer of Wayne and Taco Time and Lauren Stewart says he's probably going to try and come out. I know I've had a couple messages. So anyways, this is what we're going to do. Bottle Screw Bills has opened up a table for us to give away. So this is going to be four tickets to the show. June 22nd in Calgary. If you are interested in these tickets, all you need to do is message myself on Twitter. So DM us or message Adam on Instagram. And all you do need to do is answer the question, who is the last Toronto Blue Jay to win rookie of the year? Last Toronto Blue Jay to win Rookie of the Year. DM Adam or I, Twitter or Instagram, with the answer. We'll put those into uh, a little draw thing, and uh, on Friday we'll let you know who has that table. So anyways, honestly, uh, would love to see everyone out at the live show. If you don't know what to expect, it's what Adam and I do. is live entertainment. So it, fingers crossed, should be good. Okay, Be a good time. Be a good time. <laughs> there you go okay um mailbag let's get to it we're 13 minutes in scott uh we're gonna start with a dm from Sabi on twitter who says uh hey there quick comment on the last uh trevor richards episode uh kevin kiermeyer on the speedier side of ball players but the comparison with bolt is somewhat bold the top speed that kiermeyer reached was 30.4 feet per second, uh, while Usain Bolt's top speed in the mentioned record-setting sprint was 40.8 feet per, spec feet per second. Uh, Kiermaier's average speed over 92 feet was 19.6, while Bolt's average speed over 328 feet, 100 meters, was 34.2 feet per second. Just to clarify, apples are not oranges. So, so adequately put. Number one, Sabi, thank you so much. I, I really do love when people who are smarter than us come in with real information that we can use here. Uh, the Usain Bolt comparison may have been bold, but uh, Kevin Kiermeyer is a speedster. But Sabi is our Blue Jays fan in Sweden. So thank you, you for watching and uh, for the for the comment. Uh. I also just want to say Gary Kiermeyer is also carrying a baseball glove <laughs> and like, yeah. the, the footwear is also different. Uh, and yeah, of course it's not a direct comparison here, but uh, neither was Michael Phelps versus a great white shark, but they still ran that during shark week on discovery channel. So uh, I think it's, it's still worth pointing out like, a frame of reference, right? For like 
how fast a guy is mm-hmm. relative to something absurd. We could have used well, a cheetah he, as example, but you know Gary Gosman loves oh, when yeah. Kiermaier is out in center field. So yeah, yeah. Well, I was just listening to Jeff Blair and Gary Barker, and they were talking about <laughs> how fast they were too. All right, uh, let's get to the real mailbag here. But thank you for the comment there, Sabi. Okay, uh, Ron from Toronto in Discord uh, said, not sure, and this is a great comment, not sure how much talk this has received. But a major beneficiary of expanded playoffs is the teams at the near or absolute bottom. Uh, To look at it in the most extreme fashion, uh, compare back to when only four teams of the MLB's then 26-team league made the playoffs as compared to 12 out of today's 30 teams making it. Um, Back then, the trade deadline, at least half of the teams probably uh, or definitely knew it wasn't going to happen, so they would sell. Uh, whereas nowadays with nearly triple the percentage of the teams making it, fewer teams will decide uh, that they need to sell. Long story short, supply and demand way skewed, right, Scott? Mm -hmm. Um, So Ron says, imagine you're a team who, even with today's expanded playoffs, still think you have no shot. Uh, Well, you'll be among a smaller group of sellers to a bigger group of buyers. Um. Players like Marcus Stroman, and you touched on this right off the top, uh, are going to bring huge trade hauls that will blow out a comparable trade that might have happened in 1992. And I think this is something we saw firsthand last year, was that the trade deadline prices were definitely inflated. And I, I mean, supply and demand, Adam touched on it. With that many more, and Ron from Toronto, thank you for the comment because that that really does put into perspective what these contending teams are dealing with. And when you look at how tight everything is right now, especially in the AL East, it is going to be a very interesting trade deadline to see what some of these prospects and returns are going to be for these sought-after players from these bottom feeding teams. And that that's another thing we talked about throughout the last month is if let's say the Jays do decide to, to jump the gun a little bit and get into the trade market early. How much more capital is that going to cost to get that extra month? And maybe is it worth it? If you're going to overpay for something you need, is it worth it to, to get it before everyone else is also trying to get it? Um, it might be worth jumping that line, the queue in line there to not need to compete with the Yankees and the Orioles and everybody, you know, like just to pay extra right out of the gate. Cause you might need to wind up paying that anyways. So I, I'm really curious to see what the market prices are going to be this year, especially with some of these new teams appearing like Texas, like Baltimore teams who have proven in the past that they, will spend ah it's uh (laughs) kind of a frustrating idea as a as a jays fan yeah uh i will say about a month ago i was going down the list uh of standings in the al i was trying to count the number of teams that looked like they were Contenders this year. Contenders for a playoff spot. I will say, I think that number has shifted since we last revisited this. Last revisited. Last visited. Redundancies here. Uh, Tampa Bay, they're a buyer. Rangers, they're a buyer. Those are the no brainers. Uh, Minnesota might stand pat, but they're not selling, right? Um, Baltimore, almost certainly a buyer. Yankees, almost certainly a buyer. Uh, Astros, buying. Blue Jays, buying. Angels, buying. Then we get to the bottom half of the league. Red Sox, under 500 right now. They're only four and a half games back of a wild card spot. 
Yeah, they're not sellers yet. Like I they're know, not they sellers not yet. Be. But I'm less confident that they're going to be buyers. Earlier, again, a month ago, felt like the Red Sox were a good team. I think this is the team that I expected them to be. is is starting to show its head. Um, they're frauds. Can I be so bold as to say that? Especially with some of the pitching injuries and lack of uh, hits they've had. Uh, Seattle Mariners, game under 500. They're four and a half games back in the wild card. I don't think the Mariners, I don't think this is the year for the Mariners. I I don't see them as buyers, but I also don't see them as sellers. Mm -hmm. This feels like a... And the same with the Sox. Like, that's the other thing, right? Is that maybe they're not buyers, but they're not contributing to the market. Right. Uh, then we go down to the uh, Cleveland Guardians. They're five and a half games back in the wild card. They're three games under 500, but they're only a game and a half back of the division. Yeah, so they're not selling. They're not selling. Uh, White Sox, eight and a half back of wild card. They're only four and a half back. I'm, the White Sox better The White sell. Sox need to sell, but... Division's so bad, Scott. And you know what's crazy? They could still be the team that wins that division. Absolutely. That's the thing is they still have so many games against division teams. Like, if they sweep the Twins, this is a whole different division, and it's so insane to think. God, that AL Central sucks. Yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. Um, And then beyond that, we got Detroit, Kansas City, and Oakland. Uh, Oakland, hottest team in baseball right now, six-game winning streak. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. The NL isn't much different. Um, Diamondbacks, Gabriel Moreno, Lourdes Gurriel Jr. Leading the Diamondbacks to the best record in the National League currently. You believe that? Yeah. They're better than uh, the Braves right now. They're better than the Dodgers. They're better than... The three hundred million dollar Mets. Their pitching has been out of this world, man. Zach Galen and Merrill Kelly have just been the backbone of that starting staff, and it is just uh, impressive what they're doing at the plate too. And I think Very just cool. adding a little bit of offense in in Lourdes Gurriel Jr. really did lengthen that lineup. Uh, there are only four teams that are. Five games or more out of, of out of a playoff position in the National League. So Cubs, Rockies, Nationals, and Cardinals. Cardinals, man, what a disappointing season for the Cardinals. I thought the Cardinals were better than they are. I don't know what it is. I mean, when you when you go through the standings, like what are we even talking? There's like six teams that might sell. Like <laughs> Prices are going to be ridiculous. The San Diego Padres, nine and a half back of their division. They're only two and a half out of a wild card spot, See, unfortunately. See, that's wild, right? But, like, man, that team needs to sell. Like, Because the, that's the thing with the Padres. The Padres could be right back as a, as a division contender totally. next year if they do totally. it right. Totally. Totally, if they do it right. So, yeah, uh, there's going to be some mega trades going on. New York Mets? Can they actually Can sell? Can you Scott? imagine if the Mets sold? New York Holy would burn itself smokes. to the ground. <laughs> I don't think they can. No, uh, yeah, we'll no see. Way. It is what it is. Um, it's going to be a wild trade deadline. Um, I think July is going to be insane for trades insane um and yeah i i really thought baltimore was going to be a bigger player in free agency this off season and they were so quiet but i i have to double down on this and say this trade deadline baltimore is going to be aggressive Mm -hmm. they have to be don't they i would agree I would agree. I would like they've got to go out and get at least one top of the rotation starting pitcher. 
Maybe another starting so. pitcher? Yeah, I would say so. Like, oof. Baltimore Orioles. Damn. Okay. They don't um, need bullpen. Like, that's, that's one thing about Baltimore is their bullpen is, so far anyways, sitting yeah. here June 13th. Yeah. Their light's out. They are. Okay. Uh, related to trades, but the next comment comes in from Scott Carter on uh, YouTube. It says, what does the team, what does the Blue Jays have? What do the Blue Jays have that it could afford to trade and actually get a good return? So what do the Blue Jays have for trade chips, uh, Mr. Belford? Well, I guess it depends on how you wish to frame this question. And exactly what he's asking. The Blue Jays definitely have desirable chips. And if you're going to cross Brandon Barriera and Ricky Tiedemann off the list, it does need to get a little bit more creative. But even with those two off the list, there's definitely some very desirable players within this Blue Jays organization that other teams would love to build off of. Okay. Now, if you're looking at the the major league roster, there is a couple players that possibly could be moved. Now, I'm thinking Santiago Espinal, Kevin Biggio, one of these bench guys who are a little bit less of a role. I'm not sure how much value they have right now with Toronto but there may be teams that are closer to the bottom of the, the league who can see the price of a Santiago Espinal and him filling in in a role where let's say they've got a second baseman that is coming up in their system. He's at double A and they just need to give another year or two to, to bridge that gap in development. Santiago Espinal has done it before. He's good at shortstop as well, so he can move around a little bit. He's showing that he can have a bat that is at least league average or slightly below, and he's good defensively. The 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 only way this works is if the Blue Jays bring up a guy like Davis Schneider who can fill in at shortstop. Now, Davis Schneider has played shortstop his whole career. However, he is mainly a second and third baseman at this point, so he has taken reps at shortstop. Um, I don't know if the Jays are comfortable with that little experience at the position behind Bo Bichette. I don't know though, you know? So, uh, if you're not going to trade anyone off the major league roster, like really Espinal and Biggie are the only guys I can see being movable personally without shaking up everything. And I don't think that's what this front office would like to do. Now, if you are looking, maybe there is some value in guys that we just talked to, right? Spencer Horowitz, um, Davis Schneider. Maybe there are teams that feel like the next, they're ready to take that step up. Most of, most likely, Scott Carter, where the value is, is pitching. And I don't know if the Blue Jays are deep enough in pitching in their minor leagues to wish to move guys like Adam Klofenstein, who has come a long ways, is at double A right now and putting up the best numbers of his career at 22 years old. Do they wish to move a Chad Dallas, who is also probably the top pitching performance in the organization currently throughout 2023? And he's at double A. Do they wish to move Sam Roberts, who is struggling a little bit at triple A, uh, double A this year, and he's only 21 years old? Do they wish to to move Roberts when maybe his value is not at its highest, and also still really does project as a usable arm, a mid rotation arm in this rotation in a year or two? I, I don't know. I, I like it's a really good question because the Jays do have value within their system. It's just it's thin. And are they prepared to basically empty the cupboards? Because that's what it would take is 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 taking some of these guys that could take big steps forward in the next year so that, that when they release the top prospects in baseball in 2024, we're like, hey, we've got three in there again. Yay. That wouldn't be the case 
if they go all in at the trade deadline and they would need to move some of those most sought after pieces. What's our biggest need, Scott? Like, what do we need to add? See, it, it, I feel like it's a double-edged sword because our biggest need is depth. But to get depth, we're going to need to trade away a bunch of our upcoming depth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... I don't know, man. Do what would Luke... be amazing for this team, dude, is if 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 a Davis Schneider just winds up getting an opportunity and running with it, right? If and that's the thing, there's no AAA pitchers who could do that for us right now. It doesn't look like there's anybody like the this team needs starting pitching. Every team needs starting pitching. Starting pitching also the most expensive thing you can go out there and try and get. This team needs a bullpen piece, at least one, probably two. This team could use an upgrade at second base. I doubt that's coming. Whit Merrifield, and we talked about this on Sunday, right? Everyone was like, well, Whit Merrifield's our second baseman. And you made a very good point of like, well, Whit Merrifield has quickly become almost a full-time outfielder, which is true. Yeah. Um, I, do you think we see Alec Manoa again? I this do. season? I do. I think so too. But I also don't I also don't think they're going to rush him and I think we're we're looking at they need to get to the end of August without Alec Manoa. Right. So okay, here's where I come down on trade needs. I don't think we need to trade for a starting pitcher. Mhm. Because of Ryu returning, right? Is your thought process here? Because of all of it. Because of... We're going to have to give up something of quality to get a starting pitcher who's going to hopefully be part of a seven-man rotation. Like, I know that you need depth, and I know that the pushback is like, well, what if Kevin Gossman has bad tacos and stuff? I think we're kind of at the point this season where we just need things to start going right. And if things go wrong, we're fucked anyways. Like, excuse my language. Yeah. But if, yeah. if Gossman, if, if Gary Gossman has bad tacos, it, whatever, we're not winning the World Series, right? So how bad do we need to add a fifth starting pitcher for a month and a half? Versus what we have to give up to get him. You know, it's not like Alec Manoa was wheeling and dealing. Mm -hmm. Like we've and gotten this will... far on the back of bad Alec Manoa. So like. And to I know, that point, Adam, to that look, point. Look if we have Casey good... Lawrence, if we just call up Casey Lawrence and we plug him into the lineup every five days and we go. Okay, this is going to be an ugly one. And Casey Lawrence's only job is to give us six innings no matter how ugly they are. I I kind of take that. Well, to that point, buddy, I was even going to just say, look at how well this team did in the bullpen day they had on Friday. Like that was a yeah. very winnable game right up until Adam Simber blew up and, and gave up the three, one lead in the eighth. Right. And then, yeah, they got blown out eight, three, but that was a very, very close and very winnable game. I still uh, don't Trevor like the Richards... idea of a bullpen day every five days. Well, so just cause it depletes the. It does the bullpen and this for is, every this is, other. This game. is the merry go round. They're going to need to be on, right. They're going to be yo yoing Bowden Francis, uh, sorry, Bowden Francis, Thomas Hatch, probably even Casey Lawrence up and down expecting them to go three innings. They're going to use openers. Trevor Richards had a phenomenal three innings in the opening bid. He had, I couldn't believe yeah. he went three innings. Yeah. Uh, Tim Mesa went 1.2 innings, you know, so that the, they can do this. How long, like the, again, you're right, Adam, in thinking that fingers crossed, they just need to get through the next month. And then hopefully Ryu can come in at the all-star break healthy and give this team five innings every five, five games. Yeah. Cause like, he's going to be back. Manoa's going to be back. Like we're, we're into a, 
a future at some point this year where we have Gary Gossman, Chris Bassett, Jose Barrios, Yusei Kikuchi, Alec Manoa, Ryu, and whoever we trade or Elvis Martinez for? <laughs> I don't know. I know you that you need depth, but like at some point too, you also just need your good guys to be healthy, and like that's part of winning too, right? So mm-hmm. I don't anticipate a move for starting pitching. I think that as painful as it's going to be to see uh, Trevor Richards combo with Thomas Hatch, that's it, man. Like that's going to be our band aid for the foreseeable future. And it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be painful. I think Richards is going to have awesome games and he's going to have stinkers. And all we can do is like weather the storm. I think. Yeah. I don't know. Not a that doesn't make me feel good, but if those other four guys are all pitching the way that they have been, and I'm gonna include Jose Barrios and Yusei Kikuchi in that mix because we're now in the middle of June and I'm still feeling good about these kids. Jose like, Barrios, they... I'm starting to warm up to. Yeah, me too. I'm 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 really I've really been impressed with Barrios and he has not let us down in well over a month now he's been very very solid i was looking at the game logs compared to last year and just the number of outings that he had that were under like four innings Mm -hmm. versus the number of times that happened this year like i feel good about jose barrios and maybe i'm jinxing it but if this team can bring in a big arm for the bullpen and a bat. They could definitely use a bat. Maybe somebody on an expiring contract. Sure. I, I things are going to be expensive, but a bat is definitely going to cost less than a expiring contract. Bat is going to cost a loss a lot less than starting pitching. Okay, uh, Juan Soto to the Blue Jays. That expiring contract bat out of That's San right. Diego. Let's uh, let's do it. Yeah. Um. So related to trades, we're going to stick on this topic here. Uh, DM on Twitter from Darian says, hate to say it, Santiago Espinal. I feel like they may trade or DFA him soon. My God, he's horrible. Davis Schneider time. Uh, To say I'd rather have Biggio over him is wild to think about, but Santiago is not hitting that homer in the eighth. This is becoming a pretty prevalent sentiment amongst Blue Jays fans is where's the Santiago Espinal we knew last year. And I, I think it's just that he's, with the lack of playing time, being exposed a little bit. I don't think they'll DFA him. I don't think there's any way they they designate Santiago for Espinal. He's got too, too much value. But does he have enough value to really bring something back in trade? Probably not without some some prospects added. Yeah, Santiago Espinal. But I mean, we're we're literally sitting here talking and complaining about bench pieces right now. So, yeah, I mean, not a lot of teams with a phenomenal twenty sixth man on the on the roster, like. Now, to Darian's point about Davis Schneider, that I can kind of get behind. Maybe it is finally time to give, I mean, all the talk was Addison Barger, but Davis Schneider has been that guy this year. He's the dude who can play both outfield positions in left and right. He plays third base, he plays second base, and has taken many, I mean, he was a shortstop up until the last couple years, and he still has taken some reps there. So he's a very versatile guy who is mashing in AAA right now. He hit two more home runs on Sunday. So his total is now up to, I think it's 14 on the year in AAA. So if you can if you can kind of catch some lightning in a bottle there with a guy like David Schneider, 25 years old, who has been around the organization for years, knows all of these big league guys because of the fact that he literally played with some of them as they were coming up the system. Uh, yeah, it might be worth giving it a, a try at this point because what are you getting out of Santiago Espinal at this point outside of defense? Not a heck of a lot. 
<sighs> Not a heck of a lot. Um, Santiago Espinal. I mean, you said it with his reduced. How how you phrase it? With his limited appearances, he's getting exposed. Yeah, but I feel like I have a hard time grappling with that because. More playing time also exposed him at the end. Of I last know. I was season. just going to say it's a funny, right? it's I a know. funny double-edged sword where it's like you got to get Santi in there just a perfect amount. <laughs> so I don't know. The Tampa I mean, Bay Rays would figure it out, though. <laughs> they would figure it out. Um, so Santiago Espinal had a awesome first two months of the season last year. Mm-hmm. Other than that. I think he's a 4A guy. Yeah. And I think that's kind of where uh, the organization has landed on him as well. Uh, and career... I mean, we talked about this over the offseason, right? The time to trade Santiago Espinal was probably. Yeah. Last year's deadline, March. probably. But yeah. Yeah. Probably the offseason off for like sure. I mean... um, same goes for Kirk. Anyways, um, I'm not that down on Kirk. I should apologize for that. Um. Espinal, career numbers, OPS plus, 98. Uh, Kevin Biggio, OPS plus for his career, 102. Uh, This season, OPS plus for Espinal, 60. That's an ugly one. Uh, Kevin Biggio, 74. Which is also ugly. Just a reminder, OPS plus is OPS, but on the scale of 100 being average. Below that, below average, above that, above average. So, I don't know. They're very similar players, in my opinion. We're talking about guys who are versatile defensively. Mm -hmm. I don't think either. I don't think either one's going to win you a gold glove, but their value comes in being able to play multiple positions. Now, Here's where it's a complicated equation is Espinal plays better defensively. I think we can agree on that. Yes. I'd rather see him at shortstop than Kevin Biggio, but I think Biggio has more diversity and that I feel more comfortable with him in the outfield, more comfortable with him at first base uh, than Santiago Espinal. Also, left-handed bat for whatever that's worth, Kevin Mm -hmm. Biggio. And then on top of that, Kevin Biggio has more power, even if it's not much. That is true, and he's shown it a little bit this year. Shown a little bit this year. He's also shown it a little bit in his career. He's got 42 career home runs Mm -hmm. to Espinal's 10. So he does have more at-bats, but it's not much. It's like 20% more at-bats. We're talking 1,200 at-bats for... Kevin Biggio and like 900 for Santiago Espinal. So the power again, it's not like I'm not saying Kevin Biggio is a, is a power hitter, but yeah, I don't know. I don't feel good about Espinal almost at all. Other than like his ability as like a defensive fill in at shortstop. That's the only which it's crazy to think Asset. that the reason he's on the team at this point is probably that. Yeah. Probably. <clears throat> okay. Um, moving on then. David Cook wants to know, does Chad Dallas have a chance to fill in at fifth starter before Manoa or Ryu returns? Jeez. No. I would say a pretty strong no here again. And and that is because he, he sits at double A right now. He just got the call up to New Hampshire uh, last month from Vancouver. He has looked incredible. And we touched off this on this off the top of the show that he probably is having the best 2023 season as a starting pitcher in the organization uh, of the affiliates anyways. Yep. But he's 22. He's still developing. I think Chad Dallas is probably two years away from truly making a significant um, contribution to the big league team. 
but it is good to have those guys who are knocking on the door and he's getting very, very close. Who knows? I think they're going to keep Chad in double A until next year. And then probably we're going to see the best triple A starting pitching depth that this team has had in years when we have Adam Kloffenstein and Sam Roberse and Chad Dallas and hopefully Yosfer Zulueta at that point is stretched out and in that triple A rotation. And then things look a lot better. Like this is this is where we keep seeing the Houston Astros and even the New York Yankees have some substantial depth and be able to really weather the storm Mm -hmm. when they have pitching injuries. I mean, the New York Yankees have had incredible, incredibly bad luck when it comes to their starting pitching health. And they're sitting, what is it, a game ahead of the Jays right now or half a game or, you know, like. Yeah, it's uh, uh, one, one game up on the Blue Jays right now. Yeah, so 2024, hopefully that depth kind of solves itself from within. But again, if you go all in at the trade deadline. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you don't have, and again, this is where I go back to like, I don't want to see us going going out and getting a starting pitcher this year. You know, I don't want to see us getting rid of our Chad Dallases and our Adam Kloffensteins and our Sam Roberses to go get a guy who's going to be our seventh starter in September. You know what's crazy about the three names you just mentioned? And I mean, I love I love all three of them. They've been very generous with their time and come on the show in the past. All three have. But Adam Kloffenstein. He's been in the in the system for three years now, right? 22 years old. Sam Roberse has been in the system now for three years, 21 years old. Chad Dallas, yeah, drafted last year, already a double A, 22 years old. So, yeah, there is some starting pitching lack of depth when you're talking triple A, but it's coming. All right, last one. We'll get out of here, Scott. This is uh, a common sentiment, I think. Uh, I've seen loads of these comments uh, in the live chat for Long Toss on loads of our videos. Uh, but I'm going to take James's comment from Patreon who DM'd and said, uh, Hey guys, seriously, why does Vladdy keep getting a pass? He's an absolute bust right now. Why is everyone letting him off the hook? Offense is struggling, and he's the biggest reason why. Yeah, and I have seen this sentiment a lot. I, I'm a little confused by it because I I don't feel like he's being let off the hook. Like I, I kind of feel like everyone is talking about Vladdy's lack of production this season, and especially the the no home runs at home. If he, if he means the media, I've heard plenty of people talk about Vladdy. If he means us, I mean, I'll say it right now. Vladdy has been incredibly disappointing, especially the last month. He's in the coldest streak of his entire career, probably. Um, he knows it. He's He's struggling. He's trying really hard to find it. I don't know oh. what else to say on this, really. Like... Where are you at on this? Like, do you think do you think the fans should be booing them? Like, oh, I don't know. Here's what I keep going back to, and I hate this. I hate any time my brother might be right. After the what was it, 2021 season, where he hit a thousand home runs, mm-hmm. my brother was wondering. Is that maybe the best season we ever see out of Laddie? Does he ever remember, get to 40 again? I remember when you read that tweet and we both were like, what an idiot. <laughs> I even predicted, we even like, I think you were like, you predicted 45 home runs or something like that, just under it for, for 2022. And I was like, he'll hit 50 this year. And we were both yeah. so off as he, squeaked in at 32 and made your brother look like a genius but like what if 35 is a career high the rest of the way 
it's possible. I guess where this I come swing from. swing is so, like, this is, you know, like his I know, the swing is, is, so, is so sweet, ugh. but the, the pitches that he chooses to swing at are not helping him out. So that said, he is 24 years old and it would yeah, it shock he's 24 me years see, old. He's, would it shock look, me, Adam, to see 28 year old Vladimir Guerrero Jr. hit 50 home runs? It wouldn't shock me. No, I just hope he doesn't do it with the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, he has an OPS plus of 125 this year. It's down like the career OPS 134. Mm-hmm. Um, his OPS plus in. 2021 was 167. That's kind of where we want to see him, right? In the 150 mm-hmm. range or higher. So, yeah, it feels disappointing. And it is. But also, I don't know. Like, maybe we just... I don't know what to say about Vladdy, man. It's hard yeah. to... Did we just view him too high? No. Like, is, no, no. You, you I'm wanna, not. I'm not. I'm not, not going to get on that train. I just, I, we saw what he can do in 2021. I am convinced Vladdy has it in him. And is if there's he, anyone on this team who can carry them for a month, it is without a doubt Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Is he a better version of Kevin Biggio? A significantly better version of Kevin Biggio. Look, I say that in jest, but also is I just mean Kevin Biggio was no. one of the. That's <laughs> yeah, fine. I don't care to to go to battle for this one. That's for sure. <laughs> is Bobachet the better hitter? Yeah. Until yeah, he's not. So? Until he's not. Who would you prioritize signing? If you could only sign one, if you had the keys to the to the safe, Bo or Vlad? I mean, I sign Bo at this point. Yeah. I'd be... What would it take to change your mind? 2021 Vlad coming back? Yeah. Honestly, and I would love to hear from everyone, the grounds crew, pipe up here. Let's Let's get some comments going on what you think the problem is with Vlad and who you prioritize and why. Because in my opinion, and we've talked about this, Adam, shortstop has so much more value on the Mm -hmm. open market than first base does. So if you are going to sign one, you need to pick. Rogers communication has come down. They have told Mark Shapiro, bud, we want one, but we only want one then yeah, it's Bo Bichette. I mean, look at what he's doing. The guy has been out of this world since September of last year. He carried the team to the playoffs in 2022. He has had them on his back. Well, this offense slumped uh, completely, everyone except him, and then picked and choose a few guys who have, have been hitting here and there. This offense have, has not been firing on all cylinders like we saw it at times last year. And the only guy who has been productive consistently is Bo Bichette. His defense has improved incredibly. I know there's some of you out there that are cringing right now just hearing me say that. But look at the numbers. Do the eye test. I mean, you can look at him and be like, oh, Vladdy still has to stretch sometimes. But, like, yeah, the plays are getting made. The, uh, the numbers are weird defensively. This is where... I always struggle with like defensive metrics as a yeah. measurement, right? Because you've got so many different ones. You've got outs about of average. You've got defensive run saved. You've got ultimate zone rating. And depending on which category you're looking at, like I'm looking at uh, defensive run saved, Bo Bichette, middling with two. Wander Franco leads the way with 10, right? But then you look at, uh, outs above average, 
uh, Bo also not very good in the outs above average. So you go, okay, well, he's not that good. But then you go to UZR, and he's like number two in all of baseball. So it's like, these metrics are so contradictory. Like, is he good? Is he not? I don't know. The errors are down this year. I'll take that. How's that? Is that good enough? I predicted Bo Bichette would be an average defensive shortstop in 2023, and so far, so good. Yeah, is I mean, he elite? Is he Wander Franco with his with his range? Yeah, probably, but he's not Wander Franco with his arm. I'll tell you that. Well, he's just got to start flipping the ball up to himself before he throws it. You know, <laughs> start having fun out there, Bo. That's what I always say. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know with with Bo. I mean, for me, it is a if I can only choose one. If it's a Willy Wonka golden ticket situation where I buy the Hershey chocolate bar, I get the golden ticket, and it says, you get to decide who the Blue Jays sign. You get one contract to offer. Who is it to? I'm going Bo Bichette, and it would take a lot to change my mind. I think I, I don't want to say I've always been there. I mean, 2021, yeah, of course. I think there's a lot of hype around around Vladdy, but Bo Bichette has, like you said, been insane since September, but he's been insane for years. Yeah. Like, leads all of Major League Baseball in hits this year, led the American League in hits last year, led the American League in hits the year before. Like, this is... uh, this is no small samples. It's a, I mean, I guess you can say small sample size, three and a half months since September where he's been at this level. Yeah. But like even the, the, the pedestrian version of Boba Shed is still a superstar offensively. My, I mean, my God, Boba Shed is on pace to hit 330. He's on pace to hit 35 home runs. He's on pace to steal 20 bases. And to do that, he's he's on pace to have between a 900 and a 1,000 OPS. And on top of that, he's been an average shortstop. Like, Yeah. Nope, that's what I want out of a shortstop. And like you said, it's a premium position. I can find a Brandon Belt to play first base. You know, I can call a guy yeah. up from the minors to, to play first base. I feel guilty even saying that because it is a discredit to how good Vlad how is. good vladdy is, is as a first good. base and I, w- I do acknowledge that but yes i would say it's not even close Vl- for me boba mm-hmm. shet needs to be our priority uh in terms of contract uh long-term future with the team it's not close and it would take a lot to change my mind on that at this point yeah so yeah i'm i'm in the same boat I know uh, it's the least interesting thing to say is I agree, but I agree. <laughs> All right. Well, that's why we're here. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let us know in the comments uh, what you guys think. If you had that Willy Wonka golden ticket, who are you giving the contract to and why? That's it for the mailbag. And that is mailbag. So thank you to everybody who reached out with a comment, a question. We do again apologize for last week, but we're back. Feel free to reach out on Twitter at Walk Off Podcast, on Instagram, the Walk Off Podcast. You can uh, join the Discord. If you're not already involved there, you can just shoot us a DM and we will send you the link for that. Now, June 22nd, Bottle Screw Bills, Calgary. It is going to be our live walk off show, comedy, giveaways, all sorts of Blue Jays talk. We are uniting Calgary Blue Jays fans. Get your tickets. The code is walk off. It's going to be the first pinned comment in the video here. Uh, you can also enter our contest. Bottle Screw Bills has opened up a table of four. So we're giving four tickets away. All you need to do is answer the question Who was the last Toronto Blue Jay to win Rookie of the Year? And you can just DM Adam on Instagram or myself on Twitter, and we will announce the winner on Friday. We'll be in touch with you, obviously, and and let you know how that goes. So, yeah, enter the contest. Calgary, let's get out there. Celebrate some Blue Jays baseball. And again, Thursday, June 22nd, there's no Jays game. 
So uh, we'll fill that baseball quota we all need. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. Really appreciate you. Feel free to hit that like button if you haven't. Subscribe if you haven't. The audio listeners, tip of the hat your way. Sometimes we feel like uh, you're the forgotten heroes in this whole thing. But to everyone, the grounds crew in total, thank you. Take care. Cheers. Bye, Dad.